Uh, today we want to talk about an important and very fundamental topic, namely the state of democracy in the United States. A few weeks before the US election, in the midst of uh, a pandemic and against the backdrop of angry protests, uh, social division, and one of the most serious economic crises since the end of World War II, democracy and its institutions are facing one of their greatest tests. Uh, are we facing a temporary crisis, an episode of irritation, or indeed a fundamental threat to the basic democratic order? This is the question we would like to address today. But in any case, I'm most delighted to welcome um, our um, speaker uh, joining in from Seattle. Actually, for him in the middle of the night, uh, uh, Donald Wise. Donald Wise is the recently retired CEO of Metzler North America, the US subsidiary of Frankfurt-based Bankhaus Metzler. Uh, so we do have some ties here from, from uh, our room here in Frankfurt to Seattle. Um, Mr. Weiss, thank you so much for joining us. And again, thank you for staying up uh, late at night. It's great to have you. Welcome. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction. It's my pleasure to be part of this conversation uh, this afternoon. I only wish I could be joining you in person, properly distanced, maybe with a face mask. But in any event, uh, joining you virtually is uh, also a pleasure as well. Um, you know, I, I, I won't be able to provide you the scholarly insight that I'm sure Professor Zieblatt will be able to share once he joins the conversation. But I, I will share with you impressions I formed uh, around this question as I've lived and traveled both within and outside the United States over the years and along the way as I've tried to understand uh, the history and nature of American democracy and my responsibilities as a citizen. Uh, your, your question, is American democracy at risk? It's obviously a very crucial question. And as you know, this isn't the first time it's been asked. Um, I would argue that our democracy has been at risk ever since our nation's founding and certainly most notably during our Civil War. Um, Personally, I first asked the question uh, about 50 years ago, shortly after the Summer of Love in the United States and during the war in Vietnam, for which I was a conscientious objector. Um, an essay I wrote at the time for my high school government class posed the question, what can, be, what can be done to bring us back to a more democratic state? When we think about our democracy being at risk, uh, those of us who are the primary beneficiaries tend to think of it as a finished work that we need to preserve, or, or if it's lost, we need to restore it. While those of us who feel disenfranchised see it as an impression that must be revolutionized or maybe even rejected. I've come to realize uh, that democracy isn't a destination, it's a perpetual journey. In 2016, a gentleman named James Kloppenberg wrote in his fascinating book, Toward Democracy, that democracy has proven malleable over the four centuries in which it has been debated and attempted in the modern world. Its meaning will always be contested. Democracy will always be unfinished precisely because it is an ethical ideal as well as a set of institutions and practices. But that's a philosophical interpretation of the question. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that most of you are more interested in the existential nature uh, of the current state of affairs in the United States. Um, and more specifically, you may be wondering, will Donald Trump un upend the ultimate democratic norm and transform himself into a dictator with the willing help of the Republican Party? How could such a man be elected president in the first place? And even if Joe Biden wins the election and there is a peaceful transfer of power, What's to stop Americans from putting another demagogue in power later on? And finally, if the Democrats win the election and secure control of the Senate, will they save us? Trump's refusal to say that he will accept the results of this election, and if he loses, to ensure a peaceful transfer of power, along with his questioning the integrity of the election, seems to signal his intention to stay in power regardless of the result. Uh, it's interesting, Professor Zieblatt in his book, uh, How Democracies Die, observed that progressive tend to take uh, Trump uh, literally but not seriously, whereas conservatives tend to take him seriously but not literally. Um, as Herr Klaus and I have discussed the current state of affairs in the U.S., we've decided we need to take him both literally and seriously, and this is certainly that situation. That said, though, I don't think he has a, co a coherent ideological vision 
that would drive him. Uh, well, uh, you know, we, we wonder if, if, if at the end of the day, you know, he's, he's seeking to become an authoritarian, but I, I don't think he has a coherent ideological vision that would drive him to that, to that end. He may be motivated out of a sense of narcissism and his clear admiration of other current authoritarians, but I think he would quickly realize that he could more easily find other ways to bolster his ego, perhaps maybe another reality TV show, which has proven quite lucrative for him in the past. Secondly, I don't think he has uh, the skills that he would need to accomplish it. I find it interesting uh, in the current debate that Democrats on the one hand paints him as a completely incapable and willfully ignorant president who can't manage the pandemic, can't win the trade war with China, and can't even profitably manage his own businesses. But on the other hand, uh, they try to paint him as a coldly malicious authoritarian who is cleverly manipulating our democratic institutions and even the election to his own ends. I do think he is manipulating our institutions, but I don't think he's doing it very cleverly nor do I think he's doing it to a clear purpose other than simple disruption and self-gratification. Third, I, I think he's missed an obvious opportunity to use the pandemic as a crisis and as a common enemy in order to consolidate his power uh, and authority. I think Dr. or Professor Ziblatt in his book would note that the hallmark of a dying democracy is, is uh, a leader using crisis as a catalyst for that kind of transformation. In fact, if anything, he's trying as hard as he can to minimize the, the sense of crisis because he really wants this election to be about his accomplishments with the economy. And the crisis uh, with the pandemic is clearly viewed as a failure of his leadership. And finally, um, and I, I think this speaks to the heart of a question about our democracy and being at risk. I do believe our democratic institutions are sufficiently robust to withstand such an assault, even if he should choose to attempt it. I think the record shows that Trump's unilateral excesses have failed more often than not because of these institutions. That's not to say that they haven't been damaged by his and, and by prior administration's efforts, but I don't think they've failed. All that said, there will be a fight over the election. I don't think there's any question about that. In fact, uh, both parties have already lawyered up and the fight has already begun in a handful of state houses across the country in the courts and, and already even at the Supreme Court. And the closer the early results are on election night and the longer it takes to count the ballots, the more bitter the fight will become. So how could we have elected such a man in the first place and can it happen again? You know, I think Trump's opponents tend to view his supporters as inherently dark and evil people while they themselves are living in light and goodness. Obama dismissively referred to people that cling to their guns and religion. Um, Clinton was even more dismissive, referring to them as despicables. And more recently, Biden apparently doesn't think that Africa, African Americans are really African Americans unless they vote for him. I grew up on a small farm in Iowa, and though I've lived in the Seattle area uh, for the last 20 years, I've made frequent trips back and forth to Iowa to manage my family farm. I grew up with, and I know many people there who voted for Trump. They were my classmates, my neighbors, my friends at church. They're hardworking patriots who fought and lost loved ones in America's wars, who built and lost and rebuilt businesses, who care deeply about the country and about their community. And even if they don't have a college degree, they're still pretty well educated, they're informed, and they're thoughtful. They aren't dark or evil but in their way, they feel as disenfranchised by progressive policies as this year's pro uh, protesters uh, feel disenfranchised by Trump and the Republican Party. Perhaps in contrast though, to the protesters on the streets, these despicables, as Clinton calls them, prefer to protest through the ballot, and that's what they did four years ago. As was in the case in my youth 50 years ago, we're, we're clearly experiencing a cultural upheaval not only in the United States, but, but across the, the, the broad democratic world. And this upheaval is taking place across a number of dimensions, including race, inequality, uh, justice. Uh, and I, I think that this upheaval will eventually settle into a newer version of who we are as Americans, as it did 50 years ago. But in the meantime, I think you can expect continued volatility in our politics, 
I don't see this as a threat to democracy as much as a necessary growth spur, as such upheavals have been in the past. And finally, uh, will the Democrats save us if Biden wins the election? I've long held the view, and, and here Klaus uh, and I have discussed this before, that the most dangerous outcome of any presidential election is for the party that wins the White House to also win both houses of Congress. In the past, we've seen both parties use this advantage to pursue a strictly partisan agenda that further alienates and polarizes both the electorate and our democratic institutions. If the Democrats win control of both the White House and Congress, which, which is quite possible at this point, I think it's reasonable to expect a determined effort on their part to further upend our norms and institutions by packing the Supreme Court, trying to eliminate the Electoral College, maybe even further weakening the filibuster. Any of these actions, whether or not one thinks that they're appropriate or good for the country, will certainly continue to divide the country. And even if they win both the legislative and ex executive branch, uh, I think it's important to remember the significant ideological differences that still exist within the Democratic Party, even though these differences for the time being have been muted for the sake of the presidential election. These divisions may resurface after the election and threaten a unified Democratic agenda. So they may not be able to pursue everything that they want to, even if they do have uh, the reins of power at that point. I've seen this play out in Seattle, uh, one of the country's most progressive cities, where both the mayor's office and our nine-member city council are completely dominated by Democrats and by one socialist. Even so, uh, there are substantial differences within the council and between the council and the mayor over how to deal with our local issues of homelessness, of police reform, of violent protests and property destruction, uh, and the illegal but government sanctioned uh, occupation of one of Seattle's neighborhoods recently. These differences have led to efforts to remove the mayor, to remove the socialist member of the city council, and in my view, ironically, uh, it led to the resignation of the career African-American police woman who had been installed as the city's uh, chief of police in 2018 to finish implementing the city's consent degree with the U.S. Department of Justice to reduce bias policing and to reduce the use of excessive force. So, you know, will Trump try to make himself a dictator? I don't think so. I think it's difficult to construct a case based on his performance and, and based on the strength of our institutions uh, to, to convince me that that's the case. Will we see this sort of, of politics play out again in the future? I think so. I, I think we're really in a period of turbulence in the United States uh, that we've been through before in our history. Uh, and I'm cautiously optimistic that we'll be able to endure it again this time. Will the Democrats make a difference? Will they be unifiers of the country instead of dividers if they win control of the White House and the, of the Capitol Hill? I'm not convinced that they will be any more than the Republican Party has been. I think we'll continue to see political division um, uh, over the next one to two administrations at least. But all that said, um, I don't believe Americans generally are as divided or polarized as our politics seems to be portrays. Um, I, I think the majority of Americans are clustered in the middle, maybe a little bit to the left, maybe a little bit to the right of center. But right now, for whom there is no unifying uh, spokesperson at the national level, we all the voices that we hear tend to be on the far left or on the far right or being dragged onto those diverse ends of the spectrum. Um, we could really use such a person, but in, in the meantime, I, I just don't see that happening. So it's really up to us as individual citizens, as it is to you in your uh, country and your federation, to step up uh, to our responsibilities as members of uh, the greater and very diverse American community. Uh, referring once again to uh, James Kloppenberg's book, uh, Toward Democracy, he noted uh, at the end of his book that fulfilling the promises of democracy depends on individuals internalizing limits on the freedom that that democracy gives them. It depends on citizens willingly challenging their own preferences rather than taking for granted its, their own uh, legitimacy. It also depends on their willingness 
to weigh their own preferences against the preferences of others. And it depends on their ability to understand that their own interests might not always align with the public interest. I believe most of my fellow citizens view the world in this way, uh, even though that may not be apparent uh, in the news, may not be apparent in the debates and in the conversations around the election. Um, but I do believe that there is, is uh, su substantial cause uh, for optimism and hope and I do think that we'll end up a much better country uh, eventually on the other side of this. So don't give up on us. Uh, I don't think this great democratic experiment uh, has yet reached its end. Thank you. Those are my, my thoughts about what's going on. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Sieber. Yes, sorry for the delay. Anyway, just to uh, introduce you very briefly, uh, you know, of course you need little introduction, really a very prominent uh, thought leader uh, in the US, also in Germany. Um, Professor Daniel Zieblatt, Eton Professor of Government at uh, Harvard University. Um, he specializes in the study of Europe and the history of democracy. Um, among his uh, widely received books is How Democracies Die, co-authored with uh, Steve Levitsky, a New York Times and Spiegel bestseller actually uh, translated into 22 languages. Um, he received numerous academic uh, awards um, and uh, really is one of the most prominent voices when it comes to discussing the uh, state and the resilience of democracy. Um, I already, you know, uh, gave an outline of what we want to talk about today. Um, and that really is, of course, the state of democracy and the challenges that we are facing at the moment, given the economic crisis, given the pandemic, of course, giving polarization protests in the US. Um, maybe I could just hand over to you and you just, uh, you know, open it up and uh, share your perspective on where we are. Yes. At the Only a couple. Thank you. Minutes. Thank you so much. Yeah, so I do, I do have a bleak, uh, picture. Um, so my co-author and I, Steve Levitsky, um, three years ago now, uh, began working on this book, How Democracies Die, because we saw warning signs. Uh, it wasn't just about the election of Donald Trump. It was, it was more broadly, we uh, saw a set of problems in American society that reminded us very much of other democracies around the world that we had studied. Um, the, the real things that sent off alarm bells for us, again, looking at the 2016 election, but also just more generally, were uh, first deep levels of uh, polarization in American society, uh, where political parties uh, regard each other as enemies rather than as rivals. Uh, but second of all, certainly the election of Donald Trump um, and his rhetoric in the campaign of 2016 um, really reminded us of um, behaviors we had seen before. Um, in, uh, around the world, never, never really in the United States with somebody running for the highest elected office in the land. So the, the willingness to um, kind of condone violence, even tacitly, uh, the um, tendency to, to or the, the unwillingness to, to uh, say that he would accept the results of the election, uh, the attacks on the media, um, and so on. So, so these, were, these were warning signs for us. Um, I think in retrospect, uh, at the time we wrote this book, I should say, uh, we, we got some criticism that we were being alarmist. Um, and I guess I would say that in retrospect, we were probably not alarmist enough. Um, uh, I think that the, there has been a lot of damage to the unwritten rules of American democracy. So I'll just, I'll just, I'll just make kind of two points uh, today because I do, I do also see some hopeful signs, I want to say. Um, so I want to talk about how I can both be worried and also see hopeful signs at the same time. So, so the first um, point I would make is that we have come to think in, the, in lots of countries that constitutions can protect us, um, that written constitutions are supposed to constrain damaging political behavior from politicians. And that, you know, and to some degree that's right, but it turns out, I think, especially in the United States where we have a very old and short constitution, that there are a set of unwritten rules um, around in our politics that, that actually do a lot of work in protecting us. And these are, these are what we call norms. So two are in particular worth mentioning. <clears throat> One is the norm of mutual toleration, which is the norm of accepting your, your rivals as rivals and not as enemies. Um, and so no matter how much you disagree or dislike your opponent, you, you accept that they have a right to exist and compete for office. The second norm is a little less conventional, is the norm of forbearance or self-restraint, self where, where politicians and political leaders 
though possessing great power, legally or formally, show restraint and don't use that power to the full extent of the law. So a president, for example, can use uh, executive orders or can declare emergencies anytime essentially they want. Uh, they tend not to do that though because of unwritten rules of restraint. These two norms are really critical. We call these the soft guardrails of our democracy and um, they prevent normal competition from spiraling out of control. Um, what's happened over the last several years uh, is increased polarization um, driven by demographic changes, economic changes, have made it so that it's harder and harder to sustain these norms. Because when one regards one's rival as an enemy, as a threat, then of course, why would you ever accept their legitimacy? Or why would you ever show restraint in dealing with it? Um, and I think we've seen this unfolding really since the 1990s in the United States. There's examples of, of damage done on both sides. I mean, we tend to, in our book to say that the, the main impetus for this has come from the Republican side, but you know, one can find blame all around. Um, and so this, this is something that pre-existed Donald Trump and it'll long now last him. So, so, uh, so, so that's why I think we're in such a precarious situation now because our politics has become a kind of spiraling escalation where each side sees the other side as a threat, an existential threat and is willing to go to all sorts of measures. You know, and, just, and just to kind of put it in dire circumstance and dire perspective, it's these kinds of levels of polarization and the decline of these kinds of norms that have led to the collapse of democracies all around the world throughout history. Um, you know, it's when you, when, when, you know, you look at 1930s Spain, um, you look at 1970s Chile, it's when rivals view each other as enemies and are using, willing to use any means necessary, including military coups to hold on to power, to eject their opponent from power, that you get democratic breakdown. I, I don't think we're at that stage, but those elements I think are in our politics. Um, I, I would sort of looking forward though, I guess I would like to kind of point out a couple of different pathways forward, given that circumstances of where we are. Um, you know, there's some who think that we're on the verge of a kind of, um, you know, smooth functioning autocracy if Donald Trump gets elected. You know, this is like, um, you know, Chavez in, in Hungary, and, or sorry, in Venezuela, or Viktor Orban in Hungary. Um, I tend not to think that that is as great a risk. I mean, I think, I think we are in a, in a pretty dangerous spot, but there's a couple of important differences about the United States than, than these other countries. Um, Number one, we have a, we, you know, our institutions are much older. Um, we have very, you know, robust institutions still, I would say. I mean, they've weakened, I would say, over the last few years, but they remain pretty robust. Um, you know, and agencies are independent. You know, the FBI just made an arrest in Michigan. Um, you know, the FBI is not doing the bidding of, um, of Donald Trump or, you know, in some way working for the, the radical right or something. These institutions remain independent, number one. Number two, uh, the democratic opposition is incredibly strong. Um, so unlike Hungary, where you had a very fractured opposition vis-a-vis -vis uh, Viktor Orban in the United States, the Democratic Party is powerful. It, it controls the House of Representatives. It's well-financed. It has uh, you know, people in the streets. I mean, if one looks at the Black Lives Matter movement uh, this summer, I mean, there's people in the streets. It's a robust civil society. And so I think this is a hopeful sign for democracy because this means that it's hard for one side uh, to to dominate the political system, so this suggests then that you know that democracy. I mean that that the risk of a kind of full blown autocracy are are uh, you know is I think it's a it, you know it's always a risk, but one shouldn't overstate it. But that doesn't mean we're in the clear because I think there's two other possibilities. One um, is a kind of a, if increasing dysfunction, and this is something that is uh, something we all see a kind of slide into dysfunction. Because as I said, democracy requires these two norms that I talked about, and polarization is shredding these norms. And when these norms disappear, po politics is kind of constant institutional warfare. This is a world of stolen Supreme Court seats, partisan impeachments, government shutdowns, declarations of national emergency. Um, so, you know, for instance, I, I met with a group of senators uh, last year, and one of them who are on the Judiciary Committee. And um, one of them told us that we will never again in the United States see a successful Supreme Court nomination when the president's party doesn't also control the Senate. 
You know, so to have a system like that is a not a particularly dysfunctional system. The, the reason that's so worrying is that this is debilitating. I mean, what this means is that, um, you know, our government can't deal with basic major problems facing American society from ban pandemics to climate change. Uh, dysfunction erodes the public's confidence. Um, you know, the percentage of Americans who think, who are sat dissatisfied with democracy has doubled in the last 20 years. So when, when people don't believe in democracy, then, then the appeals of demagoguery is also is much greater. So, that, so that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a serious uh, potential outcome. The third uh, potential outcome that I think I'm worried about, and I'll kind of end with this one, um, this is kind of less visible, I would say, but in many ways more pernicious. And this is a slide into what um, I kind of think of as minority rule. And so I'll explain what I mean by that. So as you all know, the American system overrepresents uh, sparsely populated areas. This gets slightly technical, but I think it's really important to understand this. So the Electoral College is biased towards sparsely populated area. The Senate, because every state has two representatives, means that low population states are overrepresented. And the Supreme Court, because it's made up of the president picks the, the nominee and the Senate approves, that means that this, the uh, Supreme Court in some sense is kind of biased towards small sparsely populated areas. Now for most of America, this has always been the case, for most of American history, this hasn't mattered because both political parties had rural and urban wings. It's really in the last generation that, that the parties have now split. So the Democrats are overwhelmingly, as you all know, a big a party that represents big metropolitan areas while Republicans overwhelmingly represent sparsely populated areas. This opens up, I think, the possibility of minority rule. The last uh, two Republican presidents won the White House uh, despite having lost the popular vote. Um, George Bush did win the, the popular vote in 2004, but when we first came into office, he did not win the popular vote. This could happen again in 2020. So since 2000, the year 2000, the last 20 years, Republicans have only won the popular vote for the presidency one time in 2004, yet they've had the presidency 12 years. Um, more, uh, although this, the Republican, the, although the Senate is run by Republicans, have a majority in the Senate, Democrats actually, those 47 senators, that minority of Democratic senators actually have more votes for them than those 53 Republican senators. Um, so, and right now we have two, the most, two most rec recent Supreme Court justices, Brett Kavanaugh and Neil Gorsuch, were both selected by um, uh, presidents who didn't win the majority and confirmed by a Senate that didn't represent a majority. So this is pretty undemocratic, I would say. This is a counter-majoritarian system. Um, efforts to suppress the vote that exist across the US are also examples of kind of minority rule. When you suppress the vote, lower voter turnout, when you reduce the number of polling stations, this is a, this is a problem. So, so my point here is that um, we could be in for a period of minority rule in which governments are elected by a minority of Americans seek to tilt the playing field against the majority with the, powerful of the, with the protection of these powerful institutions, the Senate and the Supreme Court. Um, so, so why, why I said at the beginning, I have some signs of hope. So why am I at all hopeful given all of this? And I guess my, the, the final word I would say is that I think what we see um, in the election coming up with the possibility that that uh, Joe Biden will win. I think it's probably likely. And we see the mass mobilization of Americans over the course, summer of 2020. I think what you begin to see is the outlines of what we can think of as a broad multiracial democratic coalition. I think a majority of, Donald Trump has never had the support of a majority of Americans. Um, white Americans, unlike 1968, are increasingly liberal on racial questions. And I think it's very possible that you'll have a majority um, take the House, the Senate, and the uh, presidency. And what I would then suggest is a set of institutional reforms are necessary to combat this minority rule. So this means eliminating the filibuster in the US Senate. Um, this means expanding voting rights. Uh, and this may mean, a, and this, is, uh, this may mean adding states, Washington, DC. I would think that this might be a smart thing to do. Um, and this may mean eliminating the electoral college, which requires a constitutional change, so that's more difficult. Now, there's some people who might say, well, this is all very, sounds very radical and you know, the, these huge institutional changes, but we have to remember American democracy was tr dramatically transformed uh, in the early 20th century facing in a period of the 
you know, right before World War I, right after World War I in the United States was a period of incredible economic change, increased diversity due to immigration, the rise of new corporations. American citizens were dissatisfied with their democracy in ways that are very similar to today. Um, and what happened was a set of uh, progressive reformers uh, proposed a set of ideas to reform our democracy. The direct election of the Senate was introduced. Women got the right to vote. The secret ballot was introduced. Voting registration requirements were imposed. Uh, political primaries for the selecting of candidates were introduced, all in a very short period of time. These were all things that at the time seemed incredibly radical, but today seem totally uh, commonsensical and we take them for granted. And so the point is that um, the reason America, one of the reasons America had a, a strong 20th century is because we were able to reform our democracy in the early part of the 20th century. And I think we stand now at a moment where A, it's necessary and B, it's actually possible. So um, in that sense, I do think there is some hope. I think the stakes are incredibly high though at this moment. And you know, moments of um, crisis often precede breakthroughs. Um, and I hope that's where we are. It's also true that moments of crisis often lead to more crisis. And so I hope that's not where we are. Um, so I'll, I'll end it there. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Zieblatt. Again, warm round of applause here from the room. Thank you. Um, that really was fascinating. And uh, thank you so much for your very comprehensive and thoughtful analysis. Actually, fascinating to listen to both of you. Um, Don Wise, if I understood you correctly, I think kind of the main part of your argument was that kind of the, the democratic spirit, you know, the conditions of democracy are so deeply founded in the American DNA that we shouldn't be too worried. So that maybe what German philosopher Hegel called Sittlichkeit, you know, that kind of, uh, um, you know, consciousness that each and every individual is kind of responsible for, uh, for uh, the kind of moral well-being of society. Um, Professor Zieblatt, I would like to challenge you on that aspect again. Do you really think, you know, I would have always thought of, as, of America as a country where people are proud of their democracy, really one of the oldest democracies, and that this is not a country where any authoritarian leader could ever really be successful in the long run because people don't want to be ruled. It's, you know, they want their country to be ruled by the people and to live peacefully together. So do you really think that this foundation of democracy is, you know, the political scientist Birkenfelder called the conditions of democracy, you know, you cannot create them. They have to be, they cannot be created politically. They cannot be created by democracy itself. They have to be there in order for democracy to function. So that kind of, you know, societal grounding, if you like. Do you really think that this is so damaged? Is American society so polarized that they do not trust in democracy to work anymore? I, I can hardly believe that. Yeah, well, I guess I would say um, a couple of things about that. I think the, I think the laws of, uh, I, th I don't think any country is above the kind of laws of social science and the laws of society. I mean, no, no country is so exceptional that simply that's the same rules that apply to other countries don't apply to other countries. I mean, so, but that said, there are a couple of things that make the United States particularly robust as a democracy. So I, so I agree, agree with Mr. Wise in this sense that the social science is very clear that the richer a country is, the less likely it is to die. And the older a democracy is, the less likely it is to die. And in fact, no democracy as rich or as old as the United States has ever died, ever. I mean, that's just like a fact. So in that sense, we could say, well, we feel pretty good about this. Um, and there's all sorts of reasons why this is the case. And I think it speaks to the themes that you are, are talking about, which are, you know, that an old democracy means people have, a, there's a, a cultural and a, and a spirit of democracy develops around this among its citizens. A wealthy democracy is one that's robust because there's, there's so much to lose that people are willing to, you know, are willing to, are not willing to give it away. Um, also, you know, with, with wealth comes a whole series of other institutional and sociological kind of correlates, education and so on that, that help insulate and protect democracy. So, so that's right. Now, um, the, 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 one of the social scientists who's kind of made this point about rich democracies never dying. And, and actually you can pinpoint a figure that there's some kind of, I forget what the number is, but it's, you know, it's like $7,000 per capita and like $1980 or something. No country ever above, above that has ever had a democratic breakdown. There's some number that's, that's not the number, but um, 
and the US is far above that. And so we should be in safe ground. But so the, there's a political scientist who, who kind of came to this finding. Um, and he made a point though, I think in recent years where he's nervous, the guy who came, kind of discovered this, I would say, Adam Jaworski, uh, American political scientist from uh, New York University, says, you know, that the, the one thing that gives him pause is that that, that, da that data, this kind of, that I've just said, that where no rich and no old democracy has ever died is based on a particular time period. And in that time period, one of the things that wealth brought was an increased standard of living. So the idea that one's children will live better than oneself, the kind of upward mobility. Um, a question though is if that basic social contract breaks, um, doesn't that make our democracies more vulnerable? And, I, and I, so I think there's something to that. So, I mean, overall, I do, I, I do think that, um, you know, American democracy is in a better position than lots of other democracies for the, exactly these reasons. But I don't, think, I don't think we can take it for granted and assume that we're not vulnerable to the same challenges. And, I, and, and so just a final point is to say that when democracies die, it's not because people want to get rid of democracies. I mean, I, you know, I think it's not, it's, you know, you can ask people, do you want to live in democracy? People say, yes, it's it, that the scale of the conflicts get out of control. I mean, think of it as like a marriage. I mean, people, you know, a marriage is just, you know, at the end of the day, I guess a divorce happens because people want the divorce to happen. But that's sort of after the damage has been done. You know, conflict can erupt in a way that becomes so damaging that de facto you've destroyed your democracy, despite everybody's best intentions. And so that, that's the thing I think we just have to be alert for. And that's why we wrote our book is not to say that democracy is going to die in America, but it rather to alert Americans uh, in particular to the dangers, dangers of how democracies potentially um, die so that we can avert and sidestep those potential steps, those, those, those threats. Thank you very much. Uh, Don Weiss, would you like to respond to what we now heard from Professor Zibat, any remarks from your side? And, and I, I, you know, I think all the warning signs that uh, the professor has identified are, are evident. Um, and I, I think the challenge is, is going to be somehow fostering, you know, it's not a question of, you know, what do we do with the Supreme Court or what do we do with Congress? Um, it really is, uh, I think, a question of how do we get Americans to have a conversation um, around these 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 divisions in in a constructive way, as opposed to in a uh, uh, such a strongly adversarial way. And I, I really don't know the answer to how to make that happen. Um, thinking about, for example, uh, the electoral college. Uh, I mean, I think there, I, I would probably have a fundamental ideological uh, difference of of opinion about the value and the merit of of the electoral college. Um, and, in fact, in this last election, as I understand Hamilton's original intent for the Electoral College, which is basically to avoid the mob uh, uh, putting in, in, in power a demagogue, the electoral, electoral College failed not because of sort of its minority bias, uh, but because it didn't act independently and, and uh, say, you know, this guy's a demagogue, we shouldn't allow him to be president of the United States. So I, I, you know, in my mind, uh, the, electrical, the Electoral College plays an important role in sort of evening the playing field. Uh, uh, Professor Zeblatt, I, I, uh, I uh, disclosed earlier in, in my remarks that I grew up on a small farm in Iowa. So, mm -hmm. so this notion of letting San Francisco dictate what should happen in Iowa just, just uh, you know, I find kind of frightening. Um, but I do think that, that it hasn't worked the way it's supposed to. Uh, in fact, I was disappointed that the Supreme Court recently uh, upheld the right of states to limit the role of the electors uh, to whatever the states dictate uh, it should be. I thought that was a step away from uh, the original constitutional intent uh, of the Electoral College. But that's, that's just one example of, of you know, a sort of fundamental ideological difference that we ought to be able to talk about uh, and, and, and come to some kind of a resolution that takes into account not only the original intent of the founding fathers, but the reality of where we are today as a society and as a culture and craft a solution going forward that makes sense uh, for the broader community. We don't have a mechanism for that conversation. And I think that's what uh, Professor Zeblatt is talking about as well. It certainly doesn't exist in politics. Um, I think most Americans would like to have that conversation and would be open to that conversation. And that's where I find hope. What I don't see is a mechanism for, for having that conversation at this point. Bye-bye. Uh -huh.